I'm Trevor Phillips. This is Common Ground, where each week we look for agreement on a hot-button issue dividing the nation. Tonight... Institutional racism, racism is a problem all over the UK. It's a problem. And it's in Buckingham Palace. So the one person isn't responsible. Panto may be coming early this year, complete with eggs thrown from the cheap seats. The drama roiling the land tonight is this. Was Meghan right about the monarchy? The Duchess of Sussex maintains that she fell in love with a prince, but instead of entering an enchanted castle, was dragged into a swamp of snobbery and racism. Her supporters say she's the victim of a brutal briefing war waged by the old guard at the palace. Meghan's kinder critics say that she never really got her head round the role of a princess and should have failed the audition. Our choice tonight. How should Meghan be cast? Sad Cinderella or scheming ugly sister? Or perhaps the reality is more complex than a blunt archetype. In the next 30 minutes, we go in search of common ground. With me tonight, the broadcaster and former royal correspondent, Jenny Bond, the actor and director, Kalechi Okafor, and Tessa Dunlop, historian and author of Elizabeth and Philip, a story of young love, marriage and monarchy. Thank you all. Let's first of all agree that we aren't family therapists here. <laughs> um, in this discussion, I'm more interested in the conduct and the future of the royal household as a major British institution. Now, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex say that the institution did little to protect them against media intrusion. They were belittled. Their family was subject to racial slurs. So let me start by asking you all, in the light of the latest controversy over remarks by Lady Hussey, what we've seen of the upcoming documentary by the Duke and Duchess, um, are they wronged or are they just plain wrong? Tessa. I think it's non-binary insofar as I, the, the way it's cast in our media in particular, and by the way, then projected all over the world with our headlines surfacing in countries where it's, it's not comfortable viewing, doesn't look good on us as Brits. This is our, one of our most famous national institutions. It's not about are you anti-Harry and Meghan or pro-Harry and Meghan. You're right, it's much more subtle and complex than that. But what's happened is a deeply emotional, unhappy couple exited an institution that was proved not to be fit for purpose. And that is a travesty, given just how important they are to, as I mentioned, our global brand. They were found literally sleepwalking, and we're going to be paying for this for some time to come. Uh, Kalichi, um, do you agree that it was really more a problem about the nature of the institution than about the nature of the people who entered it? Definitely. I think that the monarchy is antiquated, it's outdated, um, the practices are really draconian, and yet we persist in trying to keep up all of this pomp and, and, and all of these ceremonies. And I, and I want us to maybe take some time to think about the fact that maybe Meghan was the perfect person to enter that institution to show us the things that we should have noted much early on in terms of, like, the history of the monarchy and everything else. I think that they saw what... You know, they made, basically made a macrocosm of the microcosmic, like, things, interactions that we have in the day-to-day -day in Britain. Okay. So I'm not uh, surprised. Let, let's, let, let me go to Jenny. Uh, how, what do you think about that, Jenny? You've been closer to the household for longer than the rest of us. What do you think about Kalichi's um, analysis that actually what happened was, for whatever reason, this marriage showed up cracks and problems that existed in the royal household already? Uh, well, I think Alicia is right. She was the perfect person to enter a modern monarchy, and she was fated as such, such and welcomed as such when she arrived in her new royal life. 
Um, I do think that obviously there is a hierarchy, which uh, Harry has now suddenly discovered. Of course, there's a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy in every big firm, every big institution. And I think therein lies the problem. I don't think uh, Meghan understood that she was not only marrying into a family, she was marrying into an institution and into a firm. And in a firm, there is a chief executive. And I think it came perhaps as a bit of surprise to her that she was not going to be at any point the chief executive because she was a very and is a very independent, uh, forthright, um, mature woman um, of strong opinions. And all that is to be lauded. But it is a difficult fit in an institution. Uh, the Kalichi, this thing's existed for a thousand years. Um, do you think it's possible, as Jenny's suggesting, that um, the Duchess of Sussex simply didn't understand what she was getting herself into. I think it's really interesting the way that when we want to, regarding Meghan specifically, we give her all of this kind of scheming uh, capacity and capabilities. I notice it with the British press, right? But then on the other hand, then it becomes this whole thing of, well, she just didn't understand. So if we're going by this argument that she didn't understand, then why so much vitriol? Why? Yeah. I think you make... Two interesting points. One, I don't believe she did understand or she chose not to, but I too take issue with the vitriol, especially the vitriol meted out on Meghan by older British white men. It just is weird. Tom Bauer, Piers Morgan, they never stop oh, banging uh, on about it. Steady on. I mean, no, uh, it, it's it, true. The, I'm the, so sorry. Muckraking biographies. Some of the, yeah, yeah, but some of the programs. people who've been most interested in this have been women columnists. But uh, where I think there is uh, uh, an inevitable uh, gap and there was always going to be a problem. She was much older than standard consorts, even c comparatively with, say, Prince Philip, who was in his mid-20s. Un and unlike him, he was the foreign prince. He was also very beautiful and people were very worried. He was a fortune hunter and foreign. But the difference was he was part of the firm. He was Queen Victoria's great-great-grandson. Meghan came from an entirely different world. And people try and compare her with Kate Middleton when they're chalk and cheese. Kate Middleton came from an institution, an English public school. You know, arguably the perfect Petri dish to become the next princess. Meghan comes from a very, very different world. And key is that there is no one like Meghan in the household. What is going okay. on? The head of the Commonwealth, and there is uh, under the 10% of Buckingham Palace staff, a, 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 a Kalichi a ethnic minority, like someone like Kalichi, for instance. Where okay. is a Kalichi in that? I, I want to come. I, I wouldn't want... be in the household. I want... Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I want that part. Uh, job, but, yeah. <laughs> job application registered. <laughs> Jenny, uh, before we, I want to come to this point about uh, uh, about race, but uh, before we do that, uh, what, what do you think about um, Tessa's point here that? Um, you, you said that she arrived, she wanted to be chief executive, or she didn't realise she wasn't going to be chief executive. Um, is there something in this, that this was a woman who had had a career, she already had a marriage, all of that, that actually she was unusual, if I can put it that way, for a royal bride at this level? Yeah, and that's why she would have been so brilliant. And that's also why I think uh, William did counsel Harry that perhaps they should take a little longer. I think William uh, gave Catherine, who you say came from a very middle class, upper class background, gave her 10 years to get used to what she was getting herself into. Um, and they even had a little divorce before they got married. So she was <laughs> well aware of what she was getting into. But you'd see, um, Meghan was, was welcomed by the Queen within... Uh, a few months of their relationship, certainly within the first year. Um, if you're going to make the com comparison with Catherine, uh, she didn't even meet the Queen, wasn't introduced to the Queen until she had known and been going out with William for about six years. So the comparisons um, are unjust, I think. Meghan was welcomed and the palace went as far as they could to make her life easy. They uh, persuaded Samantha Cohen, who was the private secretary to the Queen, very experienced, young woman, a lovely woman. I've known her for years um, and very much in tune with that generation, Meghan's generation. And they persuaded Sam to stay on and help Meghan uh, with her new role in the royal family. Um, I this, think they this, honestly bent over backwards to do what uh, they could. But th th this is a fair point, though, isn't it, Kalichi? That I mean, lots of people, by the way, including myself, mm -hmm. uh, when Meghan first appeared on the scene, wrote adulatory pieces saying, this is what's going to change our idea of what royalty is going to be. The palace itself briefed out how fantastic this was and so on. It, it wasn't as though everybody went, oh, sniff, where is she coming from, is it? 
Yeah, I think that's so interesting that you bring that up because, like, I... In this country, especially with who we currently even have in terms of premiership, representation politics really has us by the throat. We really think that maybe because somebody's a bit, a bit darker or, you know, of um, this gender or whatever, that we're making progress. How do you, how do you do that? How do you gild such a, I'm going to say it, a depraved institution. How, how do you do that? How, you, how do you modernise something? <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm talking as a child of colonised lands. Like, you can't convince me otherwise about this. But I'm, we're here to find common ground, right? right? But so my thing is that from the beginning, as much as um, everybody was excited, I was one of the people that was like, I'm not excited because I see where this is going. And sure enough, the tides turned. And I would like people to point out to me the exact point where it turned. What did Meghan do? Because I don't think she did anything. But, you know, I want to move it away from Meghan, because mm. that is... By well, talking I, about I, I her... will do in a moment, but let's... let's that I, I will do. But it, actually, I think Khalid has got an interesting question there. The, can either of you identify the point at which, uh, at which the tide turned? Jenny? But, uh, what happened? Well, I'm hoping very much that Meghan is going to do exactly that in the documentary. I mean, they put out the trailer teasing us. Um, I suspect it was when stories started to emerge uh, that she wasn't happy in her life at the palace and suddenly there was some criticism of her. And the beginning, as you say, Trevor, we all wrote and spoke um, in glowing terms about her. Um, but as soon as there was any criticism, I, I assume that's when she felt the tide turn. For two weeks. But, but I think there's a couple of points. The first is there was way too much stock riding on Meghan, as you make mm -hmm. the point. It was like counting by numbers. Oh, first black woman, my goodness. First divorcee, first American. She, she was put up on such a high pedestal. There, there was only going to be a crash. I felt like I had my heart in my mouth watching that wedding. Even the imbalance in, the, in, in St George's Chapel, her mum versus the entire royal family and all that. Yeah, I mean, and not that that was the royal family's fault, but it just felt to me like the princess and the pea in many respects, something somewhere was going to be crushed. But, but I think a, a, a bigger point is that we look and think, where, where did the tipping point come? Where was the problem? Actually, this is almost more about perception than reality. Yeah. It was Definitely something is. they felt. It was something she picked up the whiff off the, 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 okay. the way even she was an exotic but, woman but, she was but, Yeah, but to. This, is why, this is why it's important that we don't move away from Meghan. Exactly what Tess is saying there is why we don't move away from Meghan, because this happens to black women all of the time, black people all of the time within the UK, where it's, it's, all, it's so subtle, it's so insidious when things, dynamics start to change and, and shift around you that to articulate what is wrong makes it difficult. And this is the nature of racism. It's not meant to be this thing all of the time that's overt, that you see it. And that's the problem. A lot of people think racism is purely somebody calling you something or an act of visible violence. Sometimes it's the things that kind okay. of just fester under the surface, and um, that's what make an experience. I, I, I understand the point. Uh, let's let's uh, address it this way, Tessa. Do, had Megan been, you know, a Hollywood actress, mm. Maybe not top A list, but you know, well known and successful. She was B list. Shaped. I think we can. Okay. Own. I don't want to. Be, I don't want to be rude, but you know, she'd been what she was. But with one difference, not a person of colour. Right. Do you think it would have been any different? No, I don't. I think the main issue was cultural in terms of her Americanness, her expectations, her set of standards. I think also her age played a big part. When I talked so, about... So her, her allegation, which is actually that this is all about structural racism, you're saying it's not it's really all about that, that at all? I don't think she's pinned it... I don't think... No, I think that compounded no, no, the she, problem. No, no, she says that. <laughs> that it's entirely about that. I don't think, that. To, uh, I don't think I, she, she blames it entirely on racism. I think that's one of her main complaints. Mm. It's not her only complaint. She says that there's a legion of complaints that she's got about press treatment and so forth. But and, and intrusion and all of those things still come back to the fact that she's a black woman and with all due respect but, as a white woman who has not experienced what she has experienced, nor what I have experienced, for you to say that is um, not just that. If you knew how how damaging but, experiencing racism can be in your day-to-day -day life, to maybe okay, say let, that that's let, let, just a bit wild. I, I, no, I'm in no way suggesting that racism wasn't a component part, but we only need to look at the treatment of Wallace Simpson in 1936, or I think more relevant, the treatment of Prince Philip in the early, in the late 1940s. Uh, 
there was deep reticence. The British, having had this global monarchy in the 19th century, went to having a, a trapdoor mentality. They wanted their crown jewel to marry a Brit, and they said so. It okay. absolutely so, didn't hold back. There were so, polls on this. Jenny, what do, you, what do you think about this issue, uh, uh, about the race? You know, we had the whole story about, you know, somebody, who knows what, who, said what they said about Archie, would he be brown or not and all that stuff and now we see in the trailer for the documentary the issue of race has arisen again how important do you think it really is well clearly it's important um i i think though that we have to we're look, talking about the institution think of prince charles he set up the prince's trust and that has helped millions and millions of disadvantaged young people many many of them people young people of color uh, he is a, a king who would like in his coronation to be the representative of faith, not of the faith, but they won't let him do that. He is inclusive by na nature. He, he is an incredibly inclusive man and, of course, head of the Commonwealth now. Um, and that's a very important part of, of the monarchy, of the institution of monarchy. And, of course, much, much of the Commonwealth is made up of people of colour. I do not think there is structural racism within the institution of monarchy or within the royal family. I do think they could do better. I do think there's petty jealousies um, that, that have been demonstrated. Um, I do think perhaps they need more diversity training. But you know what? I think that is true of the BBC, of Sky, probably, of big banks, of big institutions around this country. I think okay. they're here. The, if okay. I may pick up on Jenny's the, point. Well, I just want to say what the, full disclosure. I, I myself, in fact, was a member of the Printers Trust board when I was much younger and I had hair and, <laughs> you know, uh, I was able to go out and pretend to be a young person. Uh, so uh, I... Uh, I agree with some of what, what Jenny said. Can I just uh, take you to the other issue which has um, been raised, uh, uh, which is, she, as you say, black woman. Let's talk about the woman part. Um, and coming back to what you said, Tessa, right at the very beginning about the way the press are treated. Uh, I mean, um, the Duchess of Sussex has made a great deal, and her husband has, about the way they were treated by the press. But is it so different? I mean, Camilla... Uh, the Queen now was literally the most hated woman in this country uh, at the end of the 90s. Uh, you mentioned Catherine, the Princess of Wales. Uh, I think she was described as weighty Katie uh, because, you know, she was patronised and all the rest of it. It, it. There is an issue here about the way that women in the royal circle, whoever they are, are treated, isn't there? Indeed. We've got an intersectional issue here where I think part of it feeds into race, part of it's about being foreign from an other culture and part of it's also about being a woman. A key component to being a successful player within the royal family is to have the backing of the Conservative press. And the reason why we now see Camilla as a success story in a way that they don't, by the way, yet in the Commonwealth, that story is yet to play out, is because the Conservative press have got behind her. That is all it took for Queen Camilla to fly. And the, the reverse has happened with Meghan. Now, I'm not a Daily Mail editor. I don't know when or where the nuance came in in terms of the reporting and the relationship between Meghan and between uh, th these tabloids. Yeah. But I can tell you that as early as the, the, the okay. 20th, beginning of the 20th century, the royal family recognised they needed the Conservative press. Jenny, you, you, ha you hung out with what is called the Conservative press, though you reported for... <laughs> and, and for... for um, a broadcasting organisation whose name not, is not mentioned on Sky. <laughs> what is she uh, doing here? But, because we love Jenny. Um, <laughs> do you agree with that? And, and if so, what happened? How did Camilla, I agree, something's changed, how did she win that support? Um, I think she's won the support by being uh, what Diana told me she was, actually. She said to me that Camilla was discreet and loyal and had been uh, for years and was the true love of uh, Charles. Um, and I, I think she's just won, a, won us around with her hard work. I do take issue with Harry saying in the trailer that the uh, women who marry into the royal family just endure pain and suffering. I mean, it's not true. Um, look at uh, Sophie Rees Jones, Countess of Wessex. She's fitted in wonderfully and she's very happy in her life. Let, let, let Jenny finish her point. As is Catherine Middleton. She, she had a hell of a time. 
I, Countess Wessex, if I seem to remember, that there was a picture of her topless that was mar marauded around, then that, she had that, to give that, up her that, job. That, that, that was Catherine, not Sophie. But anyway, so just finish your point, Jenny. I'm so sorry, also Sophie. That okay. You've forgotten, yeah. Trevor. Okay, I, I haven't watched it. I haven't looked at enough of those kind of pictures, photos. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny. Um, she's very happy in her life, fitted in very well indeed, both, uh, both Sophie and Catherine. So I don't um, think that Harry is, is right in what he said. And also, um, he, he says that his mother was hounded, as she was. Of course, Diana was hounded by the press. But I'm sure you've seen the, the news today that many of the pictures showing her being hounded and many of the pictures allegedly showing uh, Meghan and Harry uh, being zoomed in by the press all around them in their trailer are false. I mean, they're their trailer is full of distortions. It's very, very sloppy production values. And if that's going to be the level of the documentaries we're about to see, then yeah, so, I don't know what uh, we can believe. I mean, it, it'll, it'll no doubt be discussed um, furiously over the next few days, but right. uh, it's, it's already clear that in the trailer and in what's coming, there are, at the very least, some infelicities and things which appear to be pictures from one place which are actually from another place. Let, let me just come back and, and, and ask you about a more sort of fundamental question because we're really still wanting to talk about the institution itself. Now, the boss, the king, now has to deal with some of this. Kalichi, um, if you were to be invited into uh, Buckingham Palace... <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and 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 take take this as the next bit of the job application, and uh, the king were to say, Kaluchi, what what should I do? Because this kind of problem keeps coming mm. month after month Ooh. after month. I wanted to stop so that the institution can be genuinely useful to the country, rather than be part of a soap opera. What would you be advising? Well. I would abolish. I would abolish, but that's not that's not what we're doing right now. So we're not right. we're not doing that. Yeah. So what I would let, let's say, leave out. King, right. Could you abolish yourself? Right. So we put that to the side. What I would say is like let's think about the re like the redistribution of wealth. Let's start there because we talk about this common wealth and people talk about it with such glorification that it honestly makes me sick because how many millions of people even died in India due to the colonization of, you know, that land and then and all the countries in Africa. What are we praising exactly? And then I'm sorry, like Jenny mentioned earlier, well, you know, the Commonwealth has people of colour. Well, of course it does. That was the main reason that they could be colonised because if we're talking about how people were racialized and Sistema Natura from 1735, the whole basis of race was uh, to undermine I, us, I, I, so I, I, therefore... I, I, OK, I don't, I don't want to haunt you too much, but th there's a limit to what the king, yeah. even though he's the king, can do. What is the point do? of him, then? What, what is the but point? He, if you can, so that money, what can, what can he do with the money right now? What, but, okay, but what money right. Tessa, but just, Tessa but, what, what would you advise King Charles to do about this repeated set of problems well, that keep I occurring? I would suggest, I'd flip it around and say that the Commonwealth potentially is a sounding board, a grouping of nations, disparate nations, that is something we have away from the hoof of America that makes it really unique and special, um, that he could at least try and represent that Commonwealth within his own household. So Camilla, and I believe she's a good stick, OK? I, re I really do. I think she's a good egg. She's put up with a lot. Um, her new companions break away, breaking news even, no longer having ladies in waiting, no more lady hussies. We're going to have companions. But when I look down the list of these six women, we have Lady Catherine Brooke, Baroness Caroline Chisholm, Lady Sarah Cheswick. I googled all of them. It probably won't surprise you to hear that they are white and most of them look like they were educated and some were like Marlborough playing hockey. And, and so indeed, I think so Lady right, Catherine... We don't want to be absorbed in If I understand in the it, system. Lady Catherine Brooke is actually Lady Hussey's daughter, is that correct? Well, that wouldn't surprise me. You've done even is, more yeah. Googling yeah. than I. I have, Trevor. Je Jenny, what's um, my case? And Je like Jenny, it may be that you do get called in and asked for advice, but I'm not going to ask you to reveal any secrets. But w were you to be called in and asked for advice for the king, what would you suggest that he does now? Well, one of Charles's great strengths is actually using his influence to bang heads together, to convene meetings and uh, get them to try to sort out the problems, be it the environment or whatever. Um, and I, I think that's what he should and will be doing. I mean, there are reports, I will have to ask Ms Falani whether it's true that, that she has been invited to uh, talk to uh, Lady Susan Hussey and maybe to Charles and Camilla. They definitely need to um, have direct contact with people um, who feel affected in this way and more generally 
um, yeah, convene, talk, talk. Uh, but no, we've, done, we've done enough talking. Of... We've done enough talking. It's so asinine. No disrespect. It's so boring. Every time, all we do in these spaces is talk about, oh, well, what would you do and what would you advise? The amount of DEI that all of these corporations and organisations and institutions have going on, nothing is going to change. And actually, what you're doing is you're absorbing people into the system, making them think that they're going to make a change, when actually they're only helping you to perpetrate more violence, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Give up being the head of the state. 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 Give, up, give, give up the head okay. of being head of state. That's what you should I think Okay. Tessa, Tessa, I, I just want to ask you as a what historian. In Park, I want then? to ask you as a historian what happened in Hanslope okay. Park. But, but no, 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 hang on. I, I ask the questions here. Tessa, <laughs> um, let me just ask you uh, one last question as a historian. Um, why are we talking about this? The, the royalty has no constitutional actual power. Why is it such a big deal? It's fascinating, isn't it? I was t yesterday in, in Romania, of all places, and it was headline news there. Um, it, it, it has ricocheted right around the world. Um, Britain has an extraordinary reach, and part of that reach is because of the royal family, and it reaches across communities and generations. Netflix and, and this emerging kind of Hollywood aspect to our family, the sort of heartbeat of an ancient institution, has taken it to new generations. And it's also anomalous. It is a head of state, the, the mother of all parliaments. We are the origins of democracy in many respects, and yet we have this unelected head of state. At its best, that head of state demands that our elected, often callow politicians, have someone to bend their knee okay. to. At its best, it separates okay. our pomp and power, which I like and you don't, our okay. pomp and ceremony from political but power. But, of power. But the, tru the truth is... The, the household around it okay. needs to be a transparent, right. it needs to represent us, and that's where the failure lies. Okay. That's the fault line. I, th I think, um, insofar as we have reached uh, any common ground, I have succeeded as well as I usually do, which is not at all. <laughs> I think we are still uh, of the point of view that there are problems with the household, some of them might be uh, institutional problems that you would find in any other big institution, any big company. Uh, I don't think we entirely agree on what they are. I think we maybe agree that the king has a role now to get to grips with this, take everybody by the scruff of the neck. I don't think that we agree uh, with you, Kalichi. I don't think there's any majority for getting rid of it at the moment. So but there may be some practical things that the king could begin to do. Um, lastly, I think we will probably all basically agree that we shouldn't get too obsessed with the specific personality of the Duchess of Sussex and her husband. They may be a catalyst, they may be an indicator of something deeper, but it's a conversation uh, that's much wider than just the individuals. I would say thank you to all three of my guests. That's all we have time for now. Stay with us. We'll have all of today's news after the break.